Welcome to Podcast on the Brink, your weekly dose of Indiana basketball news and discussion, brought to you by the Assembly Call and Inside the Hall. I'm your host, Jared Morris. Join me live at assemblycall.com every Thursday night and immediately following every IU game for our live IU postgame show. And visit insidethehall.com for complete coverage of IU basketball and to join the discussion in the Inside the Hall premium forum. On this week's edition of Podcast on the Brink, a very, very special edition of Podcast on the Brink, as it's not every week that I get to talk to one of my basketball heroes growing up, but man, did I get to do that this week as our guest, the one and only Greg Graham, IU legend. You know, if you've heard me on this show, if you've ever heard me on the Assembly Call, there's a good chance I've probably mentioned Greg Graham or Calvert Chaney, because those two guys, to me... Uh, my favorite Hoosiers, just larger-than-life figures uh, you know, growing up in Bloomington at that time when I was 10, 11, 12. And so it was a real thrill to get to talk to Greg. Uh, Alex Bozich uh, joined me for this conversation. And, you know, we talked with Greg about, uh, you know, his playing career all the way from his high school days to being part of that big recruiting class to his time playing for Coach Knight uh, and to his relationship with, with Coach Knight now, you know, and just some of the things that he learned from Coach. Uh, and we also talk about, you know, what has happened to Indiana basketball since Coach Knight left. And I thought Greg really had some some interesting, candid insight there uh, that I think you'll all find very interesting to listen to. But just, you know, so many topics to cover, uh, you know, a wide-ranging conversation that I thoroughly enjoyed. So our thanks to Greg Graham for taking the time, and I think you'll really enjoy this conversation uh, here on Podcast on the Brink. And this episode of Podcast on the Brink brought to you by our sponsor, SeatGeek. And look, there are no more college basketball games to get tickets for with uh, the you know the national championship game occurring. No more basketball for a while, but you know there's baseball season uh, obviously you know ramping up right now. Football season is going to be right around the corner, and then basketball will be back. And whenever you need to get tickets, you know even if it's for if it's for a concert or some other type of live event. You want to make sure that you check out SeatGeek because for a long time, buying tickets has been difficult. It's been annoying, you know, with a few big companies who don't really care about the customer. But SeatGeek is a ticket company where the customer comes first. You know, they have more than 50,000 five-star reviews in the App Store, and they're really focused on making your experience as easy as possible. SeatGeek pulls in millions of tickets from all over the web. They rate each deal on a scale of 1 to 10, and they display them on an interactive seat map, so it's simple for you to find what you're looking for. Green dots are good deals. Red dots are overpriced. And every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone. I use it. It's the easiest way I've found to shop for tickets, uh, whether it's, again, sports tickets, you know, concert tickets, comedy shows, whatever type of live event. SeatGeek is my go-to. And best of all, listeners of this podcast get $10 off of your first SeatGeek purchase. SeatGeek supports our show, so go support them uh, as well. Use the promo code BRINK, B-R-I-N-K, for $10 off your first purchase. You can use that, again, for concert tickets, sports, comedy, whatever you want. Remember, that's promo code BRINK for $10 off your first purchase. All right, here now is our conversation with Greg Graham. All right. Well, we are joined on Podcast on the Brink this week by IU legend Greg Graham, who played at Indiana from 1989 to 1993. Kind enough to take some time to join us this week. Greg, thanks so much for coming on Podcast on the Brink. Uh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And it's uh, you know, it's one of those things. I I grew up, you know, in Bloomington, going to games. I think I was 10, 11, 12. You know, your your sophomore, junior, and senior season. And, you know, I feel like when you're when you're a kid going to games and, you know, watching players, you know, guys like you and Calvert and Damon and Allen, you guys were like larger than life, you know, so it's it's kind of a crazy thing now doing this podcast, having a chance to, you know, to actually talk with you, which is uh, something that if you had told, you know, 12 year old me that I would be doing someday, I probably would have said that you were crazy. So it's uh, it's really fun to be able to talk with you and reminisce and also catch up and find out what you're doing now. So. This, uh, no, thank you. Appreciate it. So, and and let's start there. Just kind of give us an update on on what's going on now, because I think you know a lot of people were aware that you were coaching at Warren Central. Obviously, you know you left there. I think in 2015, and uh, and moved out east uh, with your wife because of her job. So, what are you up to now? You're still coaching, I believe, right? Yes, I'm uh, still the I'm head basketball coach at Barrington High School. I've uh, been doing that ever since. Uh, I moved out here, inherited a program that was 
you know, kind of down. They have a history of uh, competing in, in, in all sports, not just basketball, but in all sports. And, um, when I moved out here, the coach had, you know, stepped down, um, and, you know, I took over the program and I think my first year we went something like six and 14. Um, but in three short years, uh, we're a top eight team. Uh, we just finished up in the elite eight, uh, one game away from the final four. So, you know, we're, we're, we're on the rise. Uh, it's, it's something that I enjoy. Uh, it's, it's kind of like bringing Indiana basketball to Rhode Island. Almost is what I, I kind of say. Huh? What are, what are maybe some of the biggest differences, you know, between how they were playing before what they expected before and what you've brought since you've been there? Well, it, it, it's primarily a mentality. The talent has always been there. It's, it's not as talented and, and talented rich, like, like Indiana, where you have, Division one basketball players every you know two or three years um, that can can play at an elite level. These are just you know ordinary kids that you know probably won't get a Division one scholarship or anything like that. They just play for the fundamentals of it and for the passion and the love for the game. And it's something that I enjoy because it's it's actually on the opposite end of the spectrum from Indiana. You know because you know none of the players expect to. Uh, they inspire to go to college and, and, and play, but not at Division One level. We're talking, you know, maybe Division Three, uh, NAIA, possibly if they're good enough. Um, but, you know, they put their heart and soul into it. They've been playing, you know, for quite a long, long time. And the community is, is, is very supportive, as, as well as the parents and the schools, um, which – you know, for me, was a was was kind of like a blessing. I mean, there's some of the things that you had to worry about, you know, in Indiana, as far as being a head coach at, at Warren Central, some of those things you don't have to worry about here, yeah. um, which is kind of refreshing. Um, so, I mean, they welcomed me with open arms, and, um, you know, there was a little concern on my part when I, you know, I met with the AD and interviewed and, and actually took the job. I was like, you know, how are they going to respond to somebody like me from Indiana who's, you know, going to be, you know, a different kind of breed uh, from what they're accustomed to. And um, they were very receptive, uh, very high basketball IQ, very smart in the classroom. Um, these are the kind of kids that, you know, you introduce to your daughter, uh, you know, cause yeah. they're that they're that they're that special. So what was your high school basketball playing experience like? You know, because you talked about how, you know, these kids aren't necessarily, you know, dreaming about, you know, going to a big school and playing. When was it for you that you really started thinking about, well, I could potentially get a scholarship like this might be something really serious for me? Um, well, for me, I mean, it was it was, you know, it was easy. I mean, it was it came early for me, um, probably about seventh, eighth grade when you have, you know, you're playing seventh and eighth grade basketball and you have a high school basketball coach coming to watch you play. Um, and being a ninth grader, not having ninth graders at Warren Central at the time when I was in junior high, uh, Warren only had, you know, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. They didn't have a, a, a freshman uh, class in the high school at the time. So having a high school coach and, and for that matter, uh, college coaches coming to watch you play as a, eighth and ninth grader was, was, was kind of special. And I, and I knew at that time that, you know, uh, there's a possibility that I could, you know, get a scholarship and, you know, have my education paid for, uh, while doing something that I love to do and something I've been doing my whole life. Greg, when you went through your recruitment, <clears throat> it's obviously a lot has changed since, uh, you went through that process to now, and I, and I know you were at Warren Central when when Devin Davis was recruited by Indiana. So I'm kind of curious from your perspective as somebody that went through it when you did. Um, what was it like back then, and then now uh, as someone who's been a high school coach for for a player who was uh, recruited by a Division One school, how different I guess is it uh, for now for kids that go through the process? Uh, well, I think the main difference is you know how players are able to market themselves now um, with everything from social media and the AAU basketball circuit uh, with the shoe companies backing some of these teams. Um, they're, they are more um, advertised, I should say, 
Um, whereas when I was coming up through high school and junior high and all that kind of stuff, I mean, that, was, that wasn't the case. Uh, we didn't have Division One coaches sitting in on summer workouts or coming into the school and uh, seeing you in the weight room and seeing you on the circuit. Uh, it just wasn't it just wasn't that type of of recruiting back then. Um, so I think social media and the internet and and how how players are able to build their brand, so to speak, is 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 definitely the difference between now and back when I was coming up. I mean, we didn't even have cell phones. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's quite a difference. I mean, and, you know, and, and I'm probably speaking my age when I, when I say that, but, you know, back then it was just, you know, word of mouth and, and friends of family or, or, uh, uh, uh a friend of a coach, you know, get your name out there said, Hey, you really got to go see this kid. And they did the, the, the grunt work or the grind work is how I like to put it. They actually came to the games, the high school games and, and sat up in the stands and watched you for a half or, or three quarters. And then, you know, they're out and then, you know, you get your, your information in the mail or your, you get phone calls. Um, whereas now coaches can reach out to kids anytime. I mean, by just getting their phone number, uh, tapping into their Twitter or Instagram or Facebook accounts and, you know, reaching them that way, obviously, you know, doing the recruiting period, but, um, then I think that's the major difference now. Greg, I'm curious uh, when you went through the process, and you, and you talked a little bit about the differences in the in the process um, going back to when you went through it as to now. But do you remember the first time that Indiana contacted you, and and what other schools, if any, uh, were involved in, in the recruiting process for you? Uh, well, the first time uh, Indiana recruited me, like I said, it was it was early on, and I think I was a eighth grader playing in a tournament in Bloomington. Um, and actually got a chance to go into assembly hall and walking up the ramp, I actually ran into coach Knight, and he pretty much asked me at that time, was I coming to Indiana? Um, and I said, yeah, uh, I don't know if it was a scholarship <laughs> offer per se at the time. Um, but it's something definitely that I wanted. I, I knew where I wanted to go. It didn't stop other schools from around the country recruiting me. Um, you know, they, they often send letters and, and, and do the phone calls and all that. But I was, I was Indiana all the way. I mean, and, and everybody do that. What was it like? You know, you talk about your recruiting. And obviously, when you came in, it was such a hyped recruiting class with the seven of you. And not all of you finished. Um, but what was it like being part of such a hyped recruiting class and, and, how were you guys able to meld in with the guys that were already there? Because obviously there were some established veterans, you know, there. And you sometimes hear about, you know, the the hype new guys come in and there's animosity from the new guys. How did that work for for your team? Well, actually, I mean, it it it, it worked out great. I mean, uh, because when we were coming in, it, it wasn't very many players left over. As you remember, I think that's true. Jay Edwards had left, um, and it was. A very few, I think Oliphant and uh, Lyndon Jones were, and uh, uh, Mark, Mark is it? Mark Davis, Mark Davis, Mark Davis. He was our, he, they were our seniors. Yeah. Um, so there was there was playing time available. Um, as far as the recruiting class, you know, it just kept growing. Uh, I think, I, I want to say Chris Lawson was the first one to commit. Um, and me shortly after, but then it just kept growing. I mean, it went to Chris and Calvert and Pat Graham and Leary and Funder. I mean, it, it just kept growing. And, you know, none of us outside of me, you know, me and Leary knew each other because we played each other in high school, but it's not like nowadays where you're friends with, you know, guys that you play on the AU circuit with and you're calling each other and say, hey, let's, let's go to Indiana. Yeah. It, it just wasn't that way uh, back then. It was just like if you were if you could play basketball in Indiana and you were if you were one of the top, you know, ten, fifteen, twenty players in the state, you were thinking about going to Indiana or Purdue. Um, so, you know, Coach Knight had a pretty good grasp on you know Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, Michigan. I mean you know, the around the big 10. I mean, he had a, a pretty much grasp on that. And outside of, you know, outside of Thunderbird and, 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 and Reynolds, we were all from Indiana. You know, so but it was, it was, 
Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, what, what I'm so what I'm saying is, you know, we were even though you know, coach knew how to recruit the state. He also knew how to go outside and still get those talented players because he was so well known. He's a legendary coach, yeah. and everybody wanted to play for him. You know, and by that point, he was almost 20 years into his time at Indiana at that point, had a very well-established reputation. What was your understanding of kind of what it was going to be like playing for Coach Knight, and how how much did that match up with what the reality was of playing for Coach Knight? Well, it was everything that I thought it would be. Um, I often tell the story that, you know, if people thought that playing for Coach Knight was hard, I mean, try re- you know, growing up in my household with my mom, <laughs> um, you know, coach Knight and my mom had a great relationship. I mean, even when he went to Texas tech, I mean, he flew my mom and a friend of her down to Texas, to, you know, for games and, and things like that. So I knew, and she knew that I would be in good hands going to Indiana. Plus I wasn't that far away from home. I didn't really want to go that far away from home because it's always where I wanted to be. I wanted to have an opportunity to play in front of friends and family, not too far from Indianapolis. Uh, playing for a legendary coach who, you know, instilled discipline, uh, tremendous amount of work ethic and determination and a passion for the game. I mean, his passion for basketball was second to none. So it was everything that I expected. Um, didn't go quite well the first year because maybe we were a little cocky and went behind the ears thinking that we were better than what we really were. And I often tell people that coach kind of breaks you down and, and 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 builds and molds you back up into that Indiana kind of player that he wants playing for him. You know, we've often heard that, and it, it's pretty easy, you know, especially given his reputation, to see how he breaks guys down. What is it like as he's building you back up? And do you recognize that as it's happening? Or, or like, what is kind of the change as you're going through that building back up part? I think it's something that you recognize and and, and, and understand at a much older age, uh, probably going into your junior junior year, you you realize what it takes to play for him and play for Indiana. Um, and being a youngster coming in, um, not knowing, um, you have the older guys and the veteran guys that that can explain it and and and, and try to show you the ropes. Um, but if you're not strong mentally. Um, and you're not confident in, in, in yourself and, and what you're capable of, then you won't make it. And, you know, unfortunately for some, uh, it didn't work out and, you know, they left uh, and still had, you know, good playing careers and, 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 and things of that, of that nature. But to play at Indiana, it, it, it took a special kind of person, a special kind of player, um, not only with the basketball tools, but from a mental standpoint, which is probably, as his old saying would be, mental is the physical is four is the one. That is so true playing for the man because um, it's all mental. I mean, you're talking about breaking it down. I mean, okay, yeah, it's, it's easy to break somebody down. I mean, he's great at it. <laughs> but can you get back up? And, yeah. and, and that's the question. I mean, and, he, and that's something that, you know, he wanted to see. He didn't, he didn't try to break you down or run you off. Um, he wanted to see how strong you were mentally. And if you can take, you know, what he was dishing and transform that and, 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 and get a hold of it and, and start producing and performing at a high level. You mentioned, Greg, the, the guys that didn't make it. And, and I don't want you to go into specifics about certain guys, but I'm curious as a player, or could you see guys that were having problems uh, with being coached that way and, and, what did the, what did the other guys on the team try to do to maybe keep them engaged and and how difficult I guess was it for for some of those guys who maybe didn't make it through? Well, trust me when I say this. I mean, no player at Indiana wants to see another player leave. Um, and those that do, I get it. I understand. I don't condemn them for it. I, I you know, I, I understand. I mean, and, and like I said, it's a, it's a mental game, and it doesn't necessarily mean from a mentality standpoint that you're weak is just that some things you just aren't going to stand for. And it can be some, some kind of some arrogance on, on both ends. Uh, you know how coach is. And then if you butt heads, 
you know, it's a long road out the doghouse. It really is. I mean, I've been there. Um, and I think there's not one player that played for him that hasn't been in his doghouse. Um, and it's hard. It's hard getting out of that. Um, but, I mean, you just got to put the work in and stick with it. And some players, I mean, you, you reach a boiling point and just say, hey, you know, I'm not going to take this anymore. And I'm, you know, I'm leaving. That's their right. Um, and, again, we all understand it. Um, that just wasn't for me. Um, I wasn't one of the guys that wanted to pick up and go elsewhere because I, I was a firm believer that, you know, the grass is not always greener on the other side. And that's, that's in basketball, that's in life. Um, but for some that who have left, it was greener on the other side. Uh, that's a, that's, that's them betting on themselves and, you know, saying that, Hey, they can go somewhere else and, and, and 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 play their game and the way that they see fit. So, Greg, we we host a community of IU fans, and when I told them that we were going to be interviewing you, you know, and kind of ask for some questions, suggestions, you know, people want me to ask about the the incredible free throw shooting night against Purdue, your amazing senior season, and we're definitely going to get to that. But one of the most popular topics that people wanted me to ask about, and it kind of goes you know along with this conversation right now, and about guys getting in Coach Knight's doghouse. Have you ever heard the infamous locker room tape that is out there that someone secretly recorded of Coach Knight yeah. kind, of, kind of going yeah. off? And mm-hmm. uh, and, and I believe and my name is all in it. it, yeah, it, I mean, it well, not you because you let him drive right by you, and if you're not going to recover, Greg Graham, you know, which is just a you know a line that everybody knows. I think I pinpointed once. I think that was your sophomore year. Do you remember exactly when that happened? Like, did that moment stand out to you, or was that just kind of a common occurrence in the world of playing for Bob Knight? I think it's a little bit of both. It's a common occurrence. It was a common occurrence. <laughs> um, but yet, yeah, it does stand out. And I, and I think, for me, um, I took that in stride, to be honest with you, because all you hear is his rants and my name and let them drive by you and this and that. Well, I end up being a defensive player of the year by now I'm a senior. Yeah. So the challenge was met. Um, you know, a lot of people get a lot of laughs out of that. I mean, because of, you know, it's coach being coach. I mean, he's going off. I mean, he's saying exactly what a coach would say to someone who he thinks or feels is capable of giving more. Um, at a young age, I mean, I was young. I didn't understand the game at that time. I mean, I, I, I had no idea how good defensively I could be, but he pushed me. He challenged me. I welcomed the challenge. I accepted the challenge and I met it head on. Yeah. And like I you think s- it was a win-win for both of us. <laughs> and like you said, you became defensive player of the year in the conference as a senior. So. I would I would say that you did. What is what's your relationship like with Coach now? Uh, I have a good relationship with him. Uh, I haven't spoken to him probably in a a couple years. I always call him on his birthday, um, and you know whether it's him picking up the phone or calling me back, um, you know it's something that I pride myself in doing every year. Um, so. I, you know, with it, you know, I, I heard his health is not as good as it it, it it once was or what people think it is. Uh, but, you know, he's, I mean, he's older now. I mean, he's, he's 78 years old. Yeah. I mean, I, I still, when I hear that, I, I just can't envision it. I can't envision coach being down or weak or, or not healthy. He was always a strong individual, whether it was physically. Uh, by a stature, uh, mentally sharp, uh, high basketball IQ. I still think of him that way. I mean, he's probably forgot about more basketball than hell we'll ever even know about. Yeah. Let's talk a little, some more about your playing experience. And, you know, when I think about you and your time at Indiana, there are so many moments that jump out. I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, when you think back to your playing days, what are the first couple of, of memories, on-court memories, that really stand out to you? Well, I think you mentioned one, the, uh, the amount of free throws, the 26 for 28 uh, against Purdue. 
that stands out. Um, the Big Ten championships, uh, going to the Final Four and having that disappointing loss to Duke stands out. Um, senior year losing to Kansas in the Elite Eight, that stands out. Allen Henderson's knee giving out, mm-hmm. um, that stands out. Um, but, you know, mo- most importantly to me is having the opportunity to play with so many great players. Um, I mean, from Calvert to Damon to Allen to Brian Evans, uh, God rest his soul, Eric Anderson, um, Jamal Meeks, Chris Reynolds, Todd Leary. Uh, I mean, it, it just it just goes on. I mean, and just to to just think back that I sent everybody a text the other day, just saying, you know that you know during the during the tournament, I said, you know, this brings back so many memories. I just want to reach out to you guys and say I love you. You know, you you mentioned uh, a moment there amidst all those great memories. You mentioned Alan Henderson's injury, and I think you know so many Indiana fans probably remember exactly where they were when they got that news. I did. I was devastated. I mean, you know, to twelve year old me, that was like just the worst news possible. And obviously, you know, that team you guys were ranked number one for most of the season. You know, I think everybody just kind of thought, you know, here's the sixth banner. Like it's going to happen this season. It just kind of felt like that's the the path that you guys were on. You know, you said you sent a text to everybody. Like when you guys get together and talk, like how much do you lament that as a missing banner or a missing opportunity? Or are you able to focus more on, on all the good things that you accomplished that season? You know, it's probably like the elephant in the room. I mean, we, you know, you talk about it and, you know, you reminisce about things and you play the what is and, you know, you talk about probably one of the most successful teams that didn't win a championship. I mean, we're right there. Um, you know, the, going undefeated in the Big Ten was something that we were striving to do. Uh, we ended up having that one loss. Um, again, that, that knee injury was was pretty severe. Uh, and, and that was a big part of what we did and what we were, we were doing that year. Um, but to have the the talent and uh, the depth um, of our bench and, and, and other players stepping up. I mean, if you recall, I mean, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I'm just, I'm just giving you the facts. When Allen went down, my scoring increased. So it was, it was a thing of everyone, first of all, you had to accept what it was. But we still had to understand that we had a job to do, and we tried to do it to the best of our abilities. I think we went as far as we can go with what we had, um, you know, I, it, it still, it still haunts us. I mean, we still, I mean, everybody thinks about it. I mean, you, how can you not? Yeah. Um, and I always say that, that the whole saying is we're one Allen Anderson knee injury away from winning a national championship. Yeah. It, you know, you mentioned how, you know, your scoring increased when Allen went down and I mean, it, you know, look, your, your entire senior year was great, but the way that you finished it was such a flourish I mean, I, I think back to that a lot. You know, I still remember the Herald Times uh, headline. I think it was after the Michigan State game. And it, I think you might have scored 32 points. And it said, the best guard in America, I think, was the headline. And I mean, mm-hmm. you know, everybody knows the stats. You were, you know, shot 55% from the field, 51% from three, Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. You know, what was it over that final stretch? Was it just that there was more opportunity, more shots with Allen out? Or was it something where you made a conscious decision or you got together with the coaches and it was like, okay, you've really got to raise your game to to a, to another level with Allen out? To be honest with you, it was more or less a level of confidence in myself. Um, I know how hard I worked to improve my shooting. Um, because when I first got to Indiana, I mean, I was more, I was defined, defined as a, a slasher, someone that can just get to the rim and athletic. By the time my career ended, I mean, I was known for being a shooter, uh, knocking down free throws, being def- uh, a def- I mean, a, a, what they call now a two-way player. Um, and it wasn't anything on my part where I said, well, the opportunities are there. I'm going to take more shots. I mean, I, I think I took the same amount of shots, just I made my, my efficiency was a lot higher than what it was previously. And then, you know, when you don't have an Allen Henderson in there, everybody's going to get more shots. <laughs> so, I mean, we didn't have our post, our best post player in there. Um, 
So we had this, uh, a lot of guys had to step up and assume a role that more likely weren't accustomed to. Um, but it all worked out. You know, I always find it interesting when you talk about the 93 team and the 92 team, it, the difference, I think, in how some people view kind of the missed opportunity. In 93, obviously, it's different because Allen goes down and it's just this, you know, what if, if he had been healthy and you just, you don't know, but we all assume what would happen because you guys have been the best team in the country all year. How do you view 92? Because that year, you guys actually, you know, made it all, you know, you made it to the Final Four, so you were a step closer. You know, you had a guy like Eric Anderson on the team who obviously had had a great tournament. And then, you know, all of us who watched that game you know, remember how it ended. And, uh, you know, many people haven't forgiven a certain official from that game. But how do you look back on that 92 Final Four appearance, you know, where you guys ended up losing? Well, I looked at it as, you know, you, you, you have to get there to understand what it takes. Um, and we got there and we faced a, a very talented, good Duke team. Um, and I think that's what springboarded us into the next season, that 93 team, because we knew what it take to get, we knew what it took to get there. And we were on our way. I mean, we were blowing through everybody. And, but it took that experience, the, the, the hurt from that loss and how we lost, um, that stayed with us that whole entire summer. And that's something that you build on. Um, yes, we were talented. Yes, we were good. We got there, but, um, you know, we didn't get it done. And so we were going into my senior year thinking that, you know, that we were going to win it. And that was the whole mindset from the coaches on down. We were, we were, we were determined to win this. So uh, again, we were well on our way. I mean, you know, trying to go undefeated in the big 10, I mean, that was, that was a pretty good accomplishment. We were trying. Uh, I think we just had that one loss, if, yep. I, if my memory serves me correctly. Just and that I think one. that loss ended up being, uh, I think we won and after Allen's injury. I think it was, I think we won, but we ended up losing to Ohio State on the road, I think. Yes. I'm not, was that, was that correct? I, I, my memory doesn't serve me. Yep. Yeah, it was, um, it was to Ohio State on the road. Yeah, and that was also after that loss. I, but you know, I remember my mom and my my aunt coming down and telling me that I had just I had just lost my uncle. Right? I mean, they they waited to tell me after the game, so it was it was a it was a double blow for me. It wasn't a, it wasn't a good day. Hmm. Greg, I got a, a two parter for you, but I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm curious. Back in the Big Ten's obviously changed a lot since. Uh, since you played, there's, I think, four diff- four more programs, th- three or four. Uh, but I'm curious, the, what was the toughest Big Ten road venue? And also, I'm curious, who was the toughest player? And, and you can't count Calbert Chaney because I know he was really tough to guard in practice. But in terms of an actual game, who was the toughest guy you uh, had to defend uh, fr- from your memory? Steve Smith, Michigan State. Mm. Yeah, I was young and trying to guard somebody six nine that can handle the ball like he could. I mean, his length and you know, trying to bend that hesitation dribble was so tough. It was so tough. But there were a lot of matchups I remember. Michael Finley, Sean Resper. Um, you know, I remember the 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 Illinois team with Battle and Gill and Hamilton and Nick Anderson, you know, the, the Michigan team, I mean, we're freshmen and they're coming off a, a you know, a national championship, you know, playing Romeo Robinson and, and Lloyd Vaught, um, Higgins. I mean, there's a lot of great talent that, that was, that was coming from the big 10 at that time. I mean, you had Ohio state with Jimmy Jackson and, and, um, the, the the big kids they had, you know, they had I think they had two huge kids in the middle. I forget their names, but I mean, it was just it was the the talent level across the Big Ten at the time. And you know, back then it was unheard of getting you know six teams into the tournament from the conference. Well, the Big Ten was doing that. I mean, we were doing that. So the talent level was there. The competitiveness was there. So you had to be a really good, talented team. Um, with experience to win in the Big Ten back then. 
Who who what what was your uh, what was the toughest road venue in, in the conference? Well, there was a couple of them. I mean, every <laughs> back then every road game was hard. <laughs> I mean, but the hardest was probably Wisconsin at the Fieldhouse, and I would say Michigan State. I think they had the Breslin Center. Um, Iowa was a tough. I mean, Minnesota that was a tough one. I mean, anywhere you, Northwestern, we, I mean, they always gave us a game up there in Evans. So, I mean, you name it, it was, it was tough. Like I said, it took a special team to go on the road and win in the Big Ten. That, that the same was if you win all your home games and win half your road games, you're probably going to be pretty good in the, in the Big Ten. You're going to be competing for a Big Ten championship. Yep. But you couldn't lose, you couldn't lose no more than three or four games in the Big Ten back then. You were out of the running if you lost any more than three games, three or four games. You were done. Yeah, man, there were some good teams back then, and so many good players yes, in the it conference. Was. Yes. So I, I want to ask you about about Calbert, and you know, for so many IU fans, you guys are linked. Obviously, I mean, played all four years together, achieved so many things together. And I remember, I don't know if you guys came to my school. I don't remember exactly what the event was, but I remember you, and actually maybe it was your senior speech even, but I remember you joked about how so many people in Bloomington had come up to you asking for Calvert's autograph and you had signed it <laughs> as, as Absolutely. Calvert. Absolutely. What was your relationship? Absolutely. What was your relationship like with him? And was there ever on your part, a great player in your own right, any, animosity about the attention that he got or anything like that and and about people asking you to sign his name as an autograph well as far as our relationship i mean oh heaven i mean that there was no animosity whatsoever we were we were so close we were a tight knit tight knit group because of, i mean we came in together we we've accomplished so much and nobody wanted to see him you know break the big 10 and 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 and, and any all, all time league score i mean nobody wanted to see him do that more than me um, I just, I mean, I was just fortunate enough and, and, and honored enough to play alongside such a great player. Um, you know, I had no idea when we were coming in that he was going to be that good. Uh, I heard about him in high school. I never, I never seen him play a senior year, uh, because he was down there in Evansville. I mean, God knows, I mean, being from, you know, the middle of the state and, and just hearing about players down there, you don't, you know, like I said, there was no YouTube and, 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 and social media and stuff like that back then. So you only hear uh, about certain players. And with Calvert, what I heard about him, this is exactly what somebody told me. He was a Greg Graham that was just probably 20, 30 pounds heavier. Hmm. And when I heard that, with a jump shot, though. And when I heard that, I'm like, man, this guy's going be pretty good. <laughs> and we didn't actually get a chance to – hang out and know each other until the Indiana All-Star game. And even then, he didn't get to play hmm. because of the foot injury. Yeah. Hmm. What, what, like, when you think back to, to practicing with all those great players, because there were a lot of nights when, you know, you guys would go out and play an opponent, and it wasn't nearly as difficult as practice must have been, you know, with just how deep those rosters were and, you know, how many great players you had on those teams. Are there any great practice battles or practice stories that you think back about that you guys had back in those days with, with, with so many great players on the team? The only the only thing about practice was that I that, that I can recall is like when you're trying to climb out of coach's doghouse, you know, and he always split teams up the red and white, and you know, it was always the the you know the white team that you know, were the, the guys that were in the doghouse, so to speak. So it was very competitive. I mean, we fouled, we hacked, we, we, <laughs> we cussed each other out. And our practice were definitely harder than games. Um, we ran no sprints. We didn't do any of that. Our, our entire energy and exertion was competing in practice every single day. And it was no more than for an hour and a half or two hours. Yeah. One one last question about your playing days, and then you know we want to talk a little bit about your NBA career, and and also talk about the current team. But you know, when I think back to 1993, 
you know, in, in so many ways, it kind of feels or felt to me like one of the last years when Indiana was really the center of the college basketball universe, you know, which is kind of how I grew up. Just, you know, that's what Indiana basketball was. I mean, you guys were number one for most of the season. All the attention Coach Knight brings. You know, you've got, you know, all Americans like you and Calbert. You've got the whole thing with Nick Nolte, you know, shadowing Coach Knight and, you know, just kind of how, how unique that whole situation was. What was it? like in in 1993 was it different at all from the three seasons that had kind of preceded that and do you at all view that as you know kind of a a shift in indiana basketball as you view the program now and 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 really you know how the program has struggled to get back to to that point but for a few seasons you know the the program really hasn't been able to to get back to the heights that you guys had in 1993 well you know Benson, i mean the the hype was nothing to us because it was more, most people view it as high. I mean, we looked at it as it was an expectation. We looked at it nothing less than that. And, 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 you know, and, and, and coach said the same thing. I mean, he knew he had a good team, um, but never, um, were we overconfident or arrogant about it? Um, he pushed us. Um, he demanded excellence. And we've accepted that. I mean, even, you know, my first year when we were 18 and 10, um, it was still the same. He still coached the same. I mean, the passion was there. I mean, coach is one that wants to win every single game. And we knew that when we, when the loss, or a loss, we knew what that, what that meant. And that meant we had to face that man the next day in practice and nobody, nobody was looking forward to that. Um, and so the expectations were high. Uh, every year that, you, I mean, when he was there, expectations are high because you knew that you were contending for something. Um, as far as the state of Indiana basketball right now, I think, you know, for quite some time, we kind of lost the focus a little bit and got away from it. Um, you know, too many players and, and with the tradition and, 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 and everything that comes with playing at Indiana, you know, like I said, it takes a special kind of player to play there. And without coach being there, I, I, I think some of that went by the wayside. Um, the expectations were, I mean, and, and the demand um, for excellence just wasn't there. I mean, I'm not saying that coaches didn't want, players to do well and, and have success. I mean, because all coaches do, but I just think that the kind of players that you bring in, um, don't fully understand what it takes to, to put that Jersey on and, and run out there in assembly hall and, 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 and compete at a high level. Um, knowing that, you know, you're playing for something. Now, everybody remembers that as far as our fan base, who can forget it? But I'm talking about the kind of players, and even maybe, maybe some to the some of the coaches that were there to some degree. I don't think they fully understand it. They felt the heat of it, but I don't think they understood what the expectations are, what 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 was demanded from from players and coaches, uh, the athletic department at 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 that time. Yeah, Greg, I'm curious. You know, you were around in the state when, you know, Indian had some some teams that 2012 and 2013, you know, they got to the Sweet 16 both of those years. Uh, you know, they were number one for, for a long time in 2013. And, and I don't want to get into a conversation about, you know, Mike Davis, Kelvin Sampson, Com Crean specifically. But I, I'm just kind of curious from your perspective as a former player, uh, I, I, do you – you know, with Indiana being, I don't want to say down as long as they have, but you know, there's there's been few and far between moments uh, that have really said that Indiana is an elite program. Now, do you, does it feel like something needs to change in order to get that back? And you know, you talked about bringing in guys. Is that is that a, is that about having the right coach in there that can that can identify those guys? Is it the administration prioritizing, hey, this is what we need, this is what the expectation is on a on a year in, year out basis? I, I'm just kind of curious if you think it can change and, and what do you think needs to happen in order for that, you know, to kind of get back to what it was? 
or, or if well, it ever I, will. Well, I, I said this quite often that, you know, I mean, you just got to recruit the state better. Um, and I don't care who the coach is. It just doesn't seem like, you know, players in the state of Indiana want to go to Indiana anymore for whatever reason. Um, uh, I don't, I don't get it because, you know, I don't even know if they're viewed as a, a, a top 10 program in the, in, in the country anymore. It's more or less a regional thing with Indiana right now. I mean, it's one of those schools that, Hey, they're in the big 10 and yes, they have some tradition. They have some banners that are, that are up there that are old. Um, nothing new. Uh, I think one of Mike Davis's team, I mean, they got to the final, you know, the final game before, but having come over nowhere close to that since then, um, you know, the team with, uh, cream's team with, uh, Yogi and, and, um, and Zeller, uh, more, I, you know, the, that was a, an Ola Depot. I mean, that was, that, that, that was a pretty good team. And I, I was, I was expecting great things from that team. Um, for whatever reason, just didn't get it done. Um, and I remember the loss in that tournament. I mean, uh, was it was at Syracuse. Yep. I, I was, yes. I was stunned, stunned on how well they played the whole entire year. And, and, you know, what they went through and, and, and what the expectations are, but it just seems like they just couldn't get over the hump. And I don't know if that's, again, and we're talking about expectations. I don't know if they handled that very well. I don't know if they read the press clippings and, and thought that they were better than what they were. I don't, you know, I don't know. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't privy to inside their locker room and, and what, what, what Coach Cream, you know, was doing at that time, but it just it just seems like, you know, that was the last team that probably had the state, you know, uh, a couple good players from the state of Indiana, um, and there may have been some that you know come through since then, but not a, not at that caliber. And for you know, and I think you need to get back to that. I don't I don't know if you can. Um, and I often said that the worst thing that happened to Indiana basketball was when you know force coach out. And it's not only for him, not only for the basketball, not only for administration, not only for the athletic department, but think about all the players that played for coach Knight. Think about all the opportunities that, you know, doors could have opened up, you know, for whatever reason or whatever career path that you may have. I mean, we'll probably have more players in, in, involved with coaching had he still been there. But it, it, it seems like when he left, there was such a disconnect because he was there for so long. And and it almost seems like they wanted to get away from that. You know, they say they wanted him to come back and he didn't want to come back and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, he was bitter. He was. He was very bitter about it. And I, I told him it's such. I mean, sometimes you just got to, you know, swallow your pride a little bit. But he, he wasn't going to do that. Um, So... You know, it, it, it's difficult to say. Uh, I thought Samson was a, I think he's a great coach. Great coach. But obviously had to let him go for for the reasons we, we all know about. Uh, I thought Kareem was a good coach, but just couldn't, couldn't get over the hump. Uh, Mike Davis was, Okay, I mean he served. He seems one of coach's assistant and, and served, but I'm not sure. You know, we welcomed and, and, and understood what he was going through, uh, or what he had to endure being a head coach at a prominent university, following behind a legend. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of lot of lot of factors that 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 go into that, and and, and kids nowadays are fickle. You know. If you're not on TV a lot, if you're not one of those, you know, blue blood schools or uh, a top top five, top ten program, they're not gonna they're <laughs> they're not gonna want to come there. Uh, IU improved its facilities tremendously. I mean, beautiful, but I don't know if that's enough. You got to have a coach that win. I mean, winning is everything. Winning solves everything. That is the one ingredient that 
solves all problems. And when you're not doing that, it's hurtful and, and it's hard. And you have to work extra, extra, extra hard to get the caliber of players in there that are going to get it done. And I, you know, and as far as, you know, Coach Miller right now, I got to give him time. We got to see. We got to see. I mean, did he win at Dayton? Of course he did. But everybody knows Coach Miller had a, a, a certain type of players that he had at Dayton that he could win with. I don't know if that gets it done in the Big Ten. So hmm. we'll see. Interesting. What I mean, as you as you've watched the first two years of of Archie's tenure at Indiana, what has maybe impressed you the most? What what? And I think you kind of just alluded to the biggest concern there. And what kind of relationship do you have with him? And and a lot of guys from your era. What kind of relationship do you have with Archie? I don't know him. Never talked to him. Uh, never met him. No, his brother. <laughs> But I, I, I don't I don't know Archie, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I often play that card like, OK, if I was if I was the head coach at Indiana, what would I do? I would probably reach out to every former player that I possibly could. Invite them back. Maybe some be a part of the program in, 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 in some capacity whatsoever. Um, sit down, have a conversation about, you know, the tradition and. And what it was like to, to play. But, you know, most coaches don't want to do that because they want to put their own footprint. And they want to do things their way. They want to, you know, they want to accomplish and, and have success doing it their way. And I get it. I understand it. But, damn, you can't, you can't throw away the past and, 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 and what Indiana stood for and, and expect to have success there. Because, the first, first of all, the fan base won't let you. So you need to wake up. And I'm not saying that he hasn't. I just never talked to him. He hasn't reached out to me. I don't even know if I even know anybody in the athletic department anymore. Hmm. Sure seems like it would be uh, good to have someone with your experience and your uh, your passion for the program to be able to get their perspective. So I, uh, you know, that, that, that can't do anything but help get Indiana back to to what well, it once was. I, you know, and it's not like I didn't offer because every coach from Mike Davis, Tom Crean, Kelvin Sampson, I reached out to them. I was there. I told them. I expressed it. I, I told several people. I was right there in the state at the time, not too far away. You know, offered, I, but they don't. Hmm. For whatever reason, like I said, they want to put their own footprint on it. It's their program. And like I said, it's almost like a, there's a, uh, when they say it was a disconnect, it was a serious disconnect because it's almost like they didn't want none of coaches, former players around. Calvary, uh, the only reason why Calvert got a chance down there with Cree at the time was because it's Calvert Cheney. How are you going to turn Calvert Cheney down? <laughs> Do you, I mean, you're right. There's obviously been a disconnect ever since coach got fired. And, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about the bitterness and, and the conversations that you had with him about that. I don't know if you saw it, but he was actually back on campus at a baseball game over the weekend, which obviously, you know, kind of got everybody's attention because it was the first time that he'd publicly been, you know, back on campus, you know, certainly at any kind of sporting event. Do you, I don't know if you've talked, well, I mean, uh, you obviously haven't talked to him because you haven't talked to them since then, but do you see any path to some kind of reconciliation? Do you think at this point it would matter? And do you think maybe that's something that could bring these different, you know, IU basketball eras and generations together in a meaningful way that would be positive for the program moving forward? You know, I thought it was long overdue, Coach, coming back. I mean, I... <laughs> Uh, you know, it was it was a welcome sight. Um, you know, I don't know if there's any kind of reconciliation that needs to, you know, the fact that he's even back on campus, I mean, maybe he's making amends, you know, and, and, and in his own little way. Um, but it was great to see. Uh, I don't know if that would help. I don't even know because how can you have Coach Knight on campus and him not – you know, come and talk to the team. He's got a baseball game. 
I mean, he's not, I mean, he loved baseball, but I mean, come on. Did he talk to Archie Miller? Did he, did he, did he address the team? Did he, did he, did or what's his relationship with glass? Um, you know, what, what was said, how, who got him back there? What, what, what was the intent? You know, but the fact that he was on campus, the place that he said he would never come back to, you know, baby steps, you know, and prayer answers a lot of, a lot of things. And like I said, it's, it's baby steps. Who knows what this will lead to? If anything, the fact that he's back on campus, uh, attended a baseball game and, 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 and back in the state of Indiana period, um, it it, it 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 brought up a lot of chatter, uh, a lot of dining room table talk. Um, a lot of people want to forecast and and predict what this meant or or you know or what purpose it served. But you know it was great having him, and, I, and I'm glad he was back on campus. But I would like to see it in a in in a in a in a role or capacity of you know let's address the real issues here. I mean, what's his relationship like with the with the athletic department and the basketball program? Because that's what he's known for. Yeah. Well, Greg, you've been extremely generous with your time, and I could go on asking you questions for hours, no question about it. But I, I don't want to take up you know too much more of your time. I, I did. I, I wanted to ask you one final question. Uh, you know, as a coach, you know, and, and obviously, you know, you coach for a while in Indiana, coaching now, uh, you know, where you live, and, and having played for Bob Knight, I'm curious, you know, as a coach, how much of, of your experience with Coach Knight you kind of incorporate now into how you are as a coach, and 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 maybe some things that you saw that you know you say, hey, look, I understand that worked for Coach Knight, but that's not going to work for me, and I'm going to do it a little bit differently. It, you know, I have to imagine when you when you coach with a guy who's so legendary and such a larger than life figure, it's got to impact a lot of what you do. But I'm curious what what you've taken and maybe what you said that's not really for me. Well, <clears throat> what I, I took away from Coach is, like I said, the, the the passion that he has for the game. I mean, that's instilled in you and. You know, you try to do things a certain way. I mean, the way that his coaching style, it, it, no one coaches like that anymore. Um, the 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 yelling, the screaming, the the berating of players, and 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 and, and things like that. You can't do that now. So you have to find your own method of of, of coaching and teaching and 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 role modeling and and, and those things, but. I am so grateful for my time that I had with this man. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was a pleasure to play for him. And not only because of who he was and, and, and what he brought to the table, but what he wanted us to be. And uh, my last conversation was he, he expressed that to me, how proud he was of me. Uh, I remember when I told him I was getting into coaching and he <laughs> he thought I was crazy because I mean, the coach is not for everybody. Um, and it's hard. It, it really is, especially when you've played the game your whole entire life and then going from playing to coaching, you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely two different career paths because, you know, being on the sidelines, not being able to um, dictate what goes on in a game, uh, that's the hard part. And getting players to understand what you want them to do and, 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 and what you want them to accomplish is another. Um, so I'm grateful. I was honored. Um, I wouldn't trade it in for anything. I, there's nothing I wouldn't change about my experience and my time at Indiana University and playing for Coach Knight. Well, Greg, this has been awesome. I, I am curious, you know, now that you've moved away from the Midwest, I mean, obviously when you were coaching in, Indiana, in Indianapolis, so many people knew you. How many people now recognize you on a regular basis for your for your career? Because as we know, there are Indiana fans all over the place, and Indiana, any Indiana fan is going to recognize you. Uh, how often do, do you get to talk about your playing days now, where you live? Uh, well, you know, this being my going into my fourth year out here in, in, in Rhode Island, it's starting to circulate right now. They're fine. I mean, they knew me as a guy that came from Indiana in the Midwest, played for Indiana. I mean, they knew all that, but they didn't know about playing for Coach Knight and, and playing at Indiana and and my my career. Um, that's circulating now. So it took some time because 
this is a different breed out here. I mean, yeah, New England is is different. <laughs> when I say different, um, from a basketball standpoint, it is very different because basketball is not the number one sport here. I mean, you got hockey, lacrosse, baseball. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, do they do they love basketball? Sure, they do. But this is not a basketball rich state. You're not getting any Division One players coming out of Rhode Island. Uh, so it's 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 difficult. It's very difficult, and I'm I'm to be honest with you, I'm homesick. I'm yeah. I'm homesick. Uh, and I'll do I I'll, I'll give anything to come back to Indiana. <laughs> Craig, I'm curious. You know, we were talking before we started re- recording. Uh, you mentioned you have a you have a son. Is he is he is he picking up the ball very much? And what's what's it like? Uh, if so, what's it like watching him? Well, he he just told me that he wants to be a basketball player and. <laughs> he uh, he wants to go to camp for the first time this summer. Uh, with I, I uh, have uh, two weeks of uh, summer camp that I do every summer, and he wants to participate in that. I mean, he attends a lot of games and practices, but now he is starting to ask me to coach him. And I tell him, you, you be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you think me being hard on you as a dad, I'm going to be even harder as a coach. Well, Greg, I know I said that it was the last question before I promise. This is the last question and we'll let you go. But I, I am curious, you know, when you're coaching your players and, you know, both at, at Warren Central and now in Rhode Island, what, like, did you ever find yourself citing moments from your playing days to make a point to guys? Like, if they didn't want to shoot free throws, be like, look, I made 26 out of 28 against Purdue. Or, you know, if they didn't want to, you know, work on defense, be like, I was defensive player of the year. Like, were there any, like, you know, just kind of trump cards from your playing days or or moments that you would pull out to be like, hey, by the way, I was pretty good at this too, and you should listen to me? Or is that not something that that you really do or that wasn't really your style? Well, to get a point across, yeah, I tell them because I my famous line to my guys: Google me. <laughs> um, you know, especially with free throws and, and playing defense and being efficient, taking good shots, uh, moving without the basketball, uh, running a motion offense. Um, you know, picking up on other players' tendencies, and when you're trying to defend them, uh, do they like to go right? Do they like to go left? Do they go right one dribble pull up jump? I mean, just tendencies, and and I said I was a student of the game. I study. I probably watch more film now as a coach than any other time as I did as a player. We watch a lot of film as you know Indiana basketball players. We watch a lot of film, but I watch more so now, and I, I still baffled on how my kids can't stop a guy from going right. I mean, because kids out here they they can't go left, and they all they can all everybody can go right, but they will not shut off that right hand. It just it just amazes me. So. There's, there's, there's nights when, you know, you're beating your head up against the wall or you're beating yourself up. It's like, what could I have done better to get my point across? And I, and I literally have to, after beating my head up against the wall, I have to tell myself, you did everything you could. <laughs> I just don't get it. <laughs> uh, well, Greg, this has been great. Like I said, it's a, it's a thrill for me to be able to, to talk with you and hear more about your experience. So thank you so much for your time. And Hey, you know, maybe we can do this again in the future. This was uh, this was a lot of fun. Thank you, Greg. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was it was a pleasure. I had a blast. Thanks for taking me down memory lane. <laughs> no, for sure. And uh, and and thank your son for us for uh, for sharing you tonight. We appreciate it. I'm sure he's going to kick out of it. He's all on the computer right now, so you know it's bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. All right, no problem. Thank you. All right, no problem. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Podcast on the Brink. We always appreciate you being here. Remember to join me and my co-hosts for more IU basketball talk at assemblycall.com and visit Alex over at insidethehall.com for complete coverage of Indiana basketball. If you want to support Podcast on the Brink, here is the single best way to do it. Tell anyone you know who loves IU hoops about us and suggest that they subscribe. Podcast on the Brink can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else podcasts are available. Tell your social media followers, email your friends, text your family members. For weekly discussion about IU basketball, they need to be subscribed to Podcast on the Brink. We'll talk to you next time. Go Hoosiers!